Gentlemen, welcome back. Hopefully you are charged up and ready to go. All right. So we've had our caffeine, we've had our healthy stuff, we've had our coffee, uh, cake, our coffee, whatever floats your boat was outside and uh, hopefully you're all ready to go. Uh, I have absolute pleasure in welcoming up uh, really the, uh, probably the best product team I've had the opportunity to work with, uh, Laurent Simoneau, who is our CTO, founder and president and his team. Laurent, come on up. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all of here today. We, uh, we have a great crowd. We have a uh, great crowd of customers, of partners. So uh, hopefully in the next 75 minutes, we will be able to follow up on Louis's vision, Louis's presentation about where we're going uh, with specific capabilities, with specific product assets, and give you a little bit more transparency in our product strategy. So I'll be, um, I'll be uh, doing this with my friends and partners, Richard Tessier, Gautzi Arab, and Sawan Deshpande. Uh, there will be three different demos. So uh, we're going to show you new, new things, new exciting things. Um, and uh, there will be multiple other sessions later on. Uh, since uh, we've become a, uh, <laughs> now that we have this uh, real customer conference, uh, we need to go through this, uh, this slide. Those who are familiar with the Dreamforce event, we are now, hey, we're now a big company, I guess. We're in our pretty credible, right? Um, so, I want also to make a uh, free advertisement for a customer, Logitech. This is the greatest clicker of all time. So you may see some, you may see some fancy moves on the slides. Hey, thanks to Logitech. All right. <laughs> all right. And um, I think it's uh, totally appropriate to move the thank you slide to number three on this deck. We want to thank you for making us smarter, to making us better as a product team, uh, by listening to our customers and our partners who are investing in Coveo or believing in Coveo, uh, we're doing a better job, I think. So this event is for you. We will be around, this product team will be around. We want to get more feedback from you. We want to know what's good, what's not so good, where we need to do a better job. Um, so thank you for your presence. Now. Let's, let's look at where we're coming from and where we're going. Um, this is a slide that kind of explains the transition of Coveo from a product perspective and capabilities perspective. As many of you know, we have started in about, well, actually 12 years ago by investing in the quote unquote enterprise search market that was on-premise targeted at Windows environments. And um, we had decent success there, but around, um, around 2014, we decided that the next paradigm was really the cloud, right? So let's move to the cloud. By moving to the cloud, it will be a lot simpler from an IT perspective. It will be more scalable. It will be uh, cheaper to operate. It will be more efficient. So that's what happened in 2014, we really transformed the company to have a highly uh, scalable, performant cloud platform that was targeted to, towards Salesforce at the start. But this allowed us to invest in new capabilities. Number one, because we are in the cloud, we can start capturing customer events. We can start capturing behavior. So all of the clicks, all of the queries, all of the facets, all of the custom events that some of our customers and partners are starting to log in our platform, this is now captured in our highly secure cloud. And this, folks, is the raw material that allows us to do AI, that allows us to do machine learning. And Coveo has really moved from a great indexing platform to an inside engine, as Louis said. It's about relevance. 
and relevance is really powered by machine learning. We have made this transition, um, I think, in an analogous fashion, an efficient fashion. We've listened to our customers and we are helping our customers. Some of them are still on premise. We're supporting their transition to cloud, as they're asking us. And for us, it's important that there's, we're not a startup anymore, right? So there's a lot of history in this company, a lot of success, and we want to bring our customers with us on this new journey, or at least that's, that's what you uh, folks, most of you are asking us to do. In 2017, as, um, as Louis mentioned in his slide, we are really investing hard to remove a lot of friction, to make Kaveo easier to use, easier to configure, easier to implement, easier to integrate in the apps that you are using each and every day. And we're investing hard also to make this available for developers. So to use some Coveo microservices, to use some Coveo components, and embed that um, into your own apps. Later on, Rich will show what our friends at Adobe have done. It's amazing, Coveo inside Photoshop. That's an example that we want to replicate and make it easier for you folks that are in the developers, uh, um, in developers category to do. So this is a priority for us in 2017. Um, so let's have a high level overview of what we do and what we invest in. How are our um, development teams distributed? So we invest in Coveo for Sidecore. Coveo for Sidecore for us is important not only because we're solving real use cases, we have a great relationship with Sidecore Corp. Um, but this is, this, is also a, um, this is also an area where we test a lot of, uh, or we test, I should say, we invest early in our um, frictionless capabilities and our developer-centric capabilities. So in Sidecore world, we have opened up our developers community earlier than any other uh, lines of businesses. And this is where now we're also including a lot of the um, behavioral data that Sidecore is capturing into our new machine learning. Salesforce is obviously highly, highly, highly strategic. Coveo for Salesforce is um, our first cloud product. Coveo for Salesforce um, is uh, used in many of your companies. I thank you for that. Later on, Sawan, who's uh, our vice president of our Salesforce line of business, will show you where we're investing to make it easier to, um, to use and easier to, uh, to implement in other organizations. And under the hood, we also have a generic product that we call Coveo Platform here that is basically the underlying generic capability that supports Sitecore, Salesforce, and other branded apps down the road that we're going to release. And what we're seeing more and more is that customers will start with this or this, and then will want to expand into this, right? Because there are other, there's uh, an economy of scale to be made. You're deploying this big platform, this big capability, and sometimes you want to power a new website or an internal portal that may or may not be hosted on Sitecore, or that may or may not be on Salesforce. So for us, that's important that this platform um, is, uh, is easy to use, easy to implement, easy to configure. And under the hood, these are the components, the key components that are part of the platform. The JavaScript UI that is now open source, the query engine that allows you to deal with relevance, boosting, rules, and so on. Usage analytics, I talked about that. Machine learning, I talked about that. Coveo connectors, this is the plumbing, but I would qualify it as, this is, this is high-tech plumbing, folks, right? This is our ability to get all of the content everywhere and make sense of it in the platform. 
There's the index, as you know, and there's a cloud infrastructure. So the way, the way we look at this at a higher level, and I'm bridging here from uh, Louis' formula um, in the previous, uh, in Louis' presentation. So where do we get the content? We get it with our connectors, and we call that secure unified indexing, right? But then the context is really the ability to um, include our search box or our recommendation boxes, our Coveo, uh, our Coveo components inside your apps. Salesforce and Sidecore first, but we have APIs um, to do more. And then usage analytics, it's really about intent. And then with machine learning, we get relevance. And through this presentation, we'll dig a little bit deeper in each of those components. So quickly, I want to give an update on Coveo for Sidecore. Uh, Coveo for Sidecore for us is, um, is doing amazingly well. There's a distribution strategy here that we're applying to other, our other products. Um, and see, this is just an example of how the cloud on Coveo for Sidecore is really picking up. The blue line is our free version that, is, that are basically on-premise, but now partners are really adapting the cloud. What is important to know is that Sidecore, even if Sidecore runs in on-premise, now people are indexing the cloud, the Sidecore on-premise content. And it's done in a very elegant fashion, and it works like a charm. So see, this kind of, this kind of curve is what we see in the market. We need to help our customers and partner trans, transform their business to the cloud when they want to do it. What is the outlook for next 12 months in our Sidecore line of business? So number one, we are going to invest more in personalization. So Sidecore has this great product that is called the Experience Database, also known as the XDB. This is where Sidecore customers do capture profile information, some activity information, some marketing, uh, some marketing information from, uh, from customers. So we are using the XDB and matching that with our own behavioral data that is stored in usage analytics to do better machine learning. And this is applied to Sidecore, and this is designed in a way that, like I like to say, normal human beings can do it. You don't need a data scientist to make it work. Um, we are also touching, and we're going to get more and more interested into this, uh, into e-commerce. We have partners that are in the Sidecore ecosystem and also outside of the Sidecore ecosystem uh, that they think that our machine learning could be included into e-commerce workflows. In other words, what is, what is the content that would help me buy faster, right? And this content may not be in the storefront, may not be in the catalog. This content may be in the Coveo index and should be pushed or injected in this micro moment, as we said, using machine learning. And uh, we are still investing hard to make our product even more seamless inside the Sidecore environment. We want this to be fluid for developers. We want this to look like native inside Sidecore. So for those Sidecore partners that are in the room, um, this is for you. You should, um, you, should, you should like where we're investing. All right. So there are additional sessions about Sidecore and the Microsoft ecosystem. Those two sessions in the afternoon will dig deeper into the Sidecore roadmap, what we're doing with Microsoft, and website search best practices also. Um, so this is where there will be more, more details about how we, what's going on with Sidecore, and there will be a, a Q&A uh, also in there. So Simon Langevin is product manager for Sidecore. He's in the room, and he, he, will, be, he will be hosting those two sessions this afternoon.
Okay, so at this point, I would ask someone to spend day to cover Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laurent, and thank you, uh, everyone, for giving us your morning today. Want to quickly cover uh, quickly cover Kaveo for Salesforce. Wrong screen. Yes, thank you. Um, so, quickly, sales, sales, Kaveo for Salesforce uh, it's been an amazing year for us in terms of the innovation you delivered, and thank you for driving us in that direction. Um, just want to give you highlights of you know, what, what are the investments we've made. First main one was you know, upgraded to the V2 platform. Uh, this is not something you will see on the front end, but behind the scenes gives us a lot more capability to deliver faster innovation to you, scalability, the machine learning. So Gautier is going to cover the V2 platform later on, but this is something behind the scenes. A lot of work went into it. The second feedback we've gotten from you is making it easy. You know, you like Kaveo, but let it be easy, drag and drop. Business analyst types can configure the, the front end, et cetera. So that's another area with the interface editor, et cetera. We've invested a lot. And if the business analyst types cannot get everything done, a developer needs to work on it, what we've done is we've open sourced the JavaScript UI so any developers can collaborate with each other and build rich search interfaces. And the last bucket really has been the Lightning, Salesforce Lightning platform. About two years ago, we made a strategic decision to kind of bank in, go all in on the Lightning platform. It's, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's an evolving platform from Salesforce, but we've invested a lot into it, and we'll continue to invest into it over the next, uh, next, uh, next year or so. Really, the culmination of all these investments came with our biggest release for this year, which happened in May our family of products launch that Louis referred to. And let me tell you why we did that. When you were using Kaveo for Salesforce, the feedback we were getting from you is like, well, there are this, there's a particular piece of, uh, of that offering that I like, then there's another piece of offering that I wa want. So we decided to break it up and give you exactly the Kaveo that you want. Some examples of that, right? First is, well, I like, I'm searching just within Salesforce, but I want the machine learning, I want better analytics, I want better control over the UI. That was one feedback we constantly got from you. Just search within, better search within Salesforce. Second things, especially in the SIs in the room, the developers in the room were saying, hey, can you give me a free offering so that I can go show it to my prospects, show it to my customers, and you know, get buy-in for Kaveo? The third of, uh, feedback we got from you is, well, you know, you have the enterprise connectors, the 50 plus connectors, but that's a big fat burrito. You know, we don't want that. We just want a taco. You know, easy cloud options or cloud connectors, can we get that? So we listened to all of that and came up with our family of products offerings. And let me walk you from left to right, right? The first free and express is search just within Salesforce, better search, um, drag and drop. You can get started with a free or express. The moment you need support, you can upgrade to Express, and you know that that's available at a low cost as well. And then when it comes to the index full operation, you know, when you have an index on our side, we launched the Pro Edition, which is essentially the easy cloud-based connectors. Within days, you can get started, and as you can see, the price point is pretty effective as well. So this is our family of products launch. Again, we launched it in May. Let me show you a quick walkthrough of, you know, of that product. Can you switch over to this computer? All right, let's jump in, right? So I'm searching, this is inside Salesforce, I'm inside a Lightning community. I search, and as you can see, there are three tabs on the top, you know, native Salesforce search, Kaveo Express, and Kaveo Enterprise. With the native Salesforce search, you know, you don't get unified results. Results are broken down by different objects. There are no facets. The, the UI is pretty clunky. When you use Kaveo Express, I'm searching just within Salesforce, four different things you get on top of the native Salesforce search, right? One, of course, is unified results. Oops, sorry. You get unified results across all objects inside Salesforce, the ones you choose to expose to the UI. You get facets on the left, something, again, you don't get with the native Salesforce search. In terms of the search results itself, a lot more ability to customize it. So when I go to the Communities tab, I get a threaded view. So that's available as Express. And then lastly, of course, the machine learning in action. So as you can see, the first result on the top, 
This is what our machine learning is recommending, and that's been boosted to the top. All this is available on top of Salesforce with the free edition and the express edition uh, offerings. Now, of course, when you want to bring in external content, you can show you, you can bring in Kaveo Enterprise, and at that point, of course, you know, if you have content repositories outside of Salesforce, for example, Confluence, YouTube, SharePoint, all those are available. You get facets, but a lot more powerful facets because you know, now you're using the Kaveo index, so you get facet counts, et cetera. You can search within facets, so really an advanced UI that, that's available. And then since you know, it's using our index, if, for example, for YouTube, you want to watch the YouTube video right within the community, you can do that. So that's a quick walkthrough of, you know, of the comparison between the different editions. Of course, since we are using you know, the Kaveo uh, uh, JS UI inside the Lightning community, drag and drop, any business analyst types can configure this UI, so I'm going into the back end quickly to show you the drag and drop aspect of it. And um, you know, I go into the interface editor, embedded inside the Salesforce Lightning Community Builder, and drag and drop, I can add any facets that I want to do, I can cu customize the search, the search results itself using drag and drop. So again, we made it business analyst friendly to be able to create the UIs you want. And since we are using the native sales Lightning platform in terms of mobile responsiveness, et cetera, this is all compatible with whatever mobile device you want. So that's what we've done over the last year or so with the Salesforce Lightning community interface. What we're doing over the next year is taking that same experience to the Salesforce Lightning console. So this is what the agents, your call center agents, will be using in Service Cloud. So let me just show that to you quickly. So this is fresh off the oven. You know, uh, the Salesforce Lightning console just got released with their summer release a few weeks ago. So we built an initial prototype. So when I open up a case inside the Lightning console, Similar to the classic console, you, you will get a Kaveo inside panel on the, on, the, on the right side. Of course, you know, if you want to show content from Salesforce, that's available. This, this knowledge tab here is Salesforce Lightning Knowledge. They're, new, they're the new knowledge platform, not the classic knowledge. And then, of course, if you have content repositories outside Salesforce, be it you know, a document repository in SharePoint or Dropbox, as well as YouTube, that's available as well inside the Lightning console. And then if you want to, as an agent, if you want to preview the video, watch it here, right here in your site panel, or even take actions from it in terms of attaching it to the case or sending it to the email right from the console sidebar, you can take those actions because it's completely integrated with the Lightning Console framework. And just like what I showed to you for the Lightning Community Interface, you can drag and drop and build this exact sidebar um, the way you want it to look and work for your agents. So this is quickly the, uh, the community, uh, the builder, uh, Lightning Builder for the, for the agent sidebar in the Lightning console. So again, this is where we are going over the next year or so. Can you switch back to the... So that was a quick uh, walkthrough of, you know, of the products uh, uh, you know, we are launching. Uh, where's my clicker? Um, in terms of... What's, you know, what's, what are the themes or areas of investments for me over the next year or so? I want to give you a quick preview. Uh, of course, the Lightning platform, as I said, it's an ongoing story with Salesforce. We'll continue investing and ma making it a uh, tighter integration with uh, what Salesforce is releasing from their side, including Lightning Console and Lightning Knowledge. Another feedback we've gotten from you is the machine learning is kind of an afterthought, and after you've gotten the cover for Salesforce, in initial um, uh, in, in configuration up and running, you do the machine learning later on. Now we are bringing it into the initial experience itself, so it's kind of built into the experience for agents, as well as you know, down the road as Einstein, Salesforce machine learning platform, that matures, being able to coexist with that, so you can see, you know, I want to use these components from Einstein versus these from Kaveo machine learning, you can do that. And then lastly, you know, the whole you know, drag and drop simplicity, we'll continue with that. We focus more on the front end until now, you know, in terms of the results and search UI, et cetera. We want to take that same drag and drop to the back end as well in terms of configuring your sources, in terms of configuring, you know, if I want to upgrade from Express to Pro, again, giving a seamless experience for that. So that's where uh, we'll be investing over the next year or so. And in terms of you know, sessions for you, uh, we have two sessions today. One is a roadmap session that uh, Greg Laporte and myself, we are covering at one o'clock. 
And the second session, this is honestly an area where, you know, uh, quite a few customers have struggled, you know, optimizing Kaveo for the agent inside the console. So this is a joint session from customer success team as well as the product team on best practices on how we can get the most out of Kaveo inside the agent experience. And then really, uh, tomorrow morning is the keynote. Uh, Atul Nanda, uh, SVP of customer success at Salesforce, is going to come talk about their journey with Kaveo and the impact we've had at their, their customer service offerings. So with that said, uh, I will hand it to Richard to talk about uh, machine learning and relevance. Thank you. All right. Good, so machine learning and relevance. So tough act to follow Kaveo for Salesforce. So, but we had a good year as well. So um, Kaveo for Salesforce, but machine, for, machine learning for us, uh, what, really, what really this is, is basically starts from our UI, captures all of the interactions. Our UI or your APIs, as uh, I'll demonstrate later on, because uh, we've, got, we've got some customers doing some amazing stuff with this. So um, our UI APIs, gathering all of the user behavior that you guys are sending us, then Capturing, based on that data capture, then we uh, process that data through all of our uh, machine learning backend, going around the, um, all of the various um, use cases that I'll talk about. We talk about query suggestions. We're talking about automated relevance tuning. We'll cover all of those and look at demos. And then obviously optimize the future uh, users that come to the site, make sure that the experience is tailored for them based on what we've been able to observe, as uh, Louis and Laurent already pointed out. So, what are the main use cases that we are uh, looking at here, the key use cases? So I talked about Intelligent Query Suggest, and this is where it starts. Uh, there's, uh, basically, there's, there was an interesting presentation by uh, the engineering uh, lead at Google Machine Learning that basically said a lot of things have changed at Google in the last 10 years, but one thing remained pretty constant. Users are typically providing 2.2 keywords for each query. So anything you can actually do to get more keywords query suggestions being one way, is obviously great because it gives you uh, more context around what the user is searching for. So we uh, invest in there as well. Automatic relevance tuning is important because this is what you return to your users. And we've seen great results, and I'll show that in demonstrations. Uh, then uh, recommendations is one of our newer offerings, and we uh, started deploying it at customer sites as well. And again, we've seen some very uh, interesting results with that uh, in different uh, kind of use cases that you typically see not directly linked to search. Again, we think that search is important, but there's other things out there, and recommendations is a big step in that direction. Then intelligent term detection is basically using the uh, intelligence of your users in terms of the queries that they're making to make sure that from there, you can actually better understand the language of uh, that company and be able to um, use that language in order to analyze very complex queries that more and more of you guys are sending to our system. The 2.2 keywords is what users are inputting, but oftentimes, as we talk about doing the, uh, performing our searches in context, what we're getting is much more than user entries. We're getting actually very long strings, so we need to be able to make sense of those. Intelligent Derm Detection is uh, working in that direction. And then personalization is actually something that applies across the board to all of our various algorithms in there and make sure that we're not doing uh, something as a, uh, as a uh, too broad coverage. We're personalizing it to uh, the, the persona that's actually uh, doing the uh, inquiries on the site at that point in time. So with that, I'll actually switch over to uh, the demo stand here and uh, walk you guys through some examples that we have that uh, will demonstrate each of these uh, use cases. All right, so to start this off, uh, we talked about Sitecore earlier, and I want to demonstrate some of the integration capabilities that we have with the uh, Sitecore XDB. So what happens here, basically, I'm going to show you, and for those of you who are already uh, familiar with Sitecore, this is going to be a fairly um, fairly basic to get started, but, ba but just navigating to the site and leveraging what the XDB is actually capturing as a profile, I can see I've just actually done one operation. I'm still unmatched uh, in the XDB. But as I keep going through the site and actually clicking on those various results, in this case, I'm going to want to build a kind of a developer profile. In order to do so, I'm clicking on some Pretty, uh, pretty technical stuff like creating custom validator and creating custom list and custom sorting algorithm, if you will. If I go back and I now look at my profile and I look at the pattern, now I've been identified as a developer. Obviously, that data is captured in uh, DXDB, but it's also leveraged, if you look 
leverage, if you look on the right-hand side here, it's actually uh, leverage for the recommendations as well. If I look at this here, I can see I've got some recommendations, and these are coming from Kaveo, and they're personalized to the profile that's been identified to me. So how do I actually see this? If I go and I look at the uh, creating a, the site menu, I actually get workflow and then uh, some more technical articles. But if I kind of do the same exercise here a little bit more quickly, because I'm sure you got the gist of it. So now if I go around optimizing the experience and I look at inline personalization and I look at multivariate testing, I'm going to be a different profile user for the XDB. So I'm going to be more of a digital marketer in this particular case, right? So the recommendations that I'm getting, if I go back now to the same kind of pages, if I go back to my building the site, if I go to creating the site menu, you'll see that what I'm getting now, if I play with this magical clicker again, um, creating a goal, which is completely different, right? I'm not actually seeing the same kind of thing that I was seeing on this slide, which was workflows, which is much more catered to a developer. So in this particular case, again, the recommendations are personalized according to what the uh, current user is on the site as identified by the XDB. So those, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty interesting. And uh, a neat way to look at this, essentially, is if I switch now to the Coveo uh, usage analytics, I can see basically that I've got here my Sidecore XDB profile actually being fed in to all this information that's coming into the Coveo usage analytics, right? So this is all captured, this is all processed by a machine learning algorithms, and this is what actually tailors the experience in the end, right within Sidecore. And all these controls are available uh, in Sidecore again. So there's no there's not a lot of heavy lifting to get this going, right? As long as you've got some XDB set up, some profiles, this will feed into Coveo, and then your machine learning algorithms will be uh, actually uh, automatically tailored to this. And then, obviously, there's also the reporting piece. So you can actually look at the profile activities that you're seeing in relation to search and recommendations within Sitecore, right, within the, um, the Coveo um, usage analytics. So you can see here I've got my queries by digital marketers, query by developers, what's the click distribution, what's the query distribution. So all of this, again, is available right within the uh, Kaleo usage analytics because we're capturing that data from, uh, from Sitecore. So that was one uh, first example of how we can actually use recommendations and see what's happening in Sitecore. <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got one fan, at least. Oh, I got more, I got more, right. Thank you, thank you. All right, next. Uh, next, now we're going to move into some real customer use cases. So, um, and what they've been doing with our platform. Uh, we're proud of what our, what our customers actually do with our platform. So, this particular case, I'm on the HNT portal. I'm running a uh, fairly uh, German query for reports. And I can see I've got my standard results list and all of that. But here on the right hand side, I've got some very important things that are recommended learning. So, Actually, our, our friends at Salesforce recognized at one point that providing results uh, and unified results was very interesting, but being able to single out some of the training material was super uh, interesting as well for their end users because this actually increases engagement and gets the users uh, more proficient on the Salesforce platform. Now, I'm, this is obviously based on just this single interaction that I've had searching for reports. Now, if I feed a bit more information to the system, and I mistyped it, we're resistant to mistypes, which is good for demos because we typically mistype a lot. So now, I actually, I've searched for campaigns. So I've changed my search. If I look here on the right-hand side, I still have two of the same recommendations, so reporting fundamentals and the other on uh, admin essentials. But I've got a new thing coming here as well, essential for marketing cloud email marketers. This is because I've started searching for campaign stuff. So I've fed more information to the system. So now we're providing. A, uh, a, a different set of recommendations so that we accompany the user in the journey that much more uh, effectively. And obviously, this will keep going on. And this is kind of a different use case than the Sitecore one, because Sitecore was on content pages. This one's on the search page. Obviously, if I go in and I basically navigate to one of those content page now, I still have that content available here. So, but I've got now the related resources, which is a little more similar to the recommendations I had. So I'm looking at managing, managing campaigns here. But obviously, I've got some related resources around just the campaign homepage. But I've also still got my recommended learnings. So if someone comes in from a different source than actually the search from Caveo, they'll still have uh, those uh, recommendations there. Uh, but we feed off not only the click on content, but we also feed off 
the, uh, the queries to make the recommendations that much more uh, intelligent. And this has been driving some interesting results at uh, Salesforce in terms of being able to drive more engagement with the uh, training materials that's available for their end users. So that was a uh, kind of a second demo around uh, recommendations and one of our, again, great customers. And congratulations again for uh, the award this morning. Now, uh, one more, Logitech. So um, in this particular case, I want to basically demonstrate uh, what we do with uh, query suggestions as well as automated relevance tuning. So um, quick example on their site, generic query, right, searching for mouse. This would be kind of the standard results that you'd get out of the box with any search engine. This is a tricky query, right? Obviously, mouse on Logitech. They're, they're selling a lot of mouses, uh, mice, uh, actually. Uh, and obviously, they all contain the word mouse. So how do you make sense of that? How do you actually figure out what's the best? Well, the best way to do it is to keep looking at the user behavior, figuring out what, what are they actually clicking on? What are they searching for when they come to the site and search for mouse? What's happening, right? And obviously, this will evolve over time because the products evolve over time. So you don't want to have to maintain that. So I've got a little widget here that allows me. And this is the standard results you would get, by the way. This is not what you'll get if you go to the Logitech website because we wouldn't want that. So thanks to machine learning, this is what you will get, right? You will get stuff like the, um, the, uh, the wireless mouse M3, M325. You'll get the M510. You'll get the MX. You'll get the M185. So you'll get popular mouses because that's what's driving actually clicks on the site. That's what people end up interacting with as far as content when they actually search for mouse. Uh, how do you validate that? Well, actually, you can just take a look at the, uh, the store. This is Logitech store. And if you look at the mouses that you have there, you've got the M705, you've got the MX, the Anywhere Mouse MX. You've got all of this. Well, if I look at my list here, I've got the Performance Mouse. I've got the M705. So I've got a significant overlap. The Anywhere Mouse MX is there as well. So I've got a lot of overlap between what we're actually providing and what the Logitech store is actually returning when you search for mouse, which is logical, right? Obviously, they're selling what, uh, what's on the store, and some of them will actually drive support inquiries. And this is what we're surfacing here in the uh, self-service experience on the Logitech website. So that's, again, a great example of leveraging the machine learning capabilities within, uh, within Logitech. Obviously, you can actually do this for uh, other types of capabilities as well, because we do uh, stuff like automatic um, thesaurus creation kind of stuff. So in this particular case, I'm searching for a query that's MX5500, and I'm getting results from the uh, from the user community, but I'm not getting any product back, right? So, and this is kind of a, uh, kind of a tricky one, uh, and I've disabled, again, the machine learning how here, but if I enable the machine learning now, I get one result, which is what I'm looking for, the MX5500. In this particular case, what happened is that it's not spelled the, the same way, right? I'm spelling it with either it's all in one word, or in this particular case, it's got a TM between the words, or it could be anything, right? Um, in this particular case, it's throwing off the, uh, the match. So what happens is that we identifying the, uh, and looking at the user visits, we've actually been able to identify that there's a lot of the users that come in searching for that, do not find the product on, the first, uh, on their first try, but then they'll rewrite the query, they'll change it, and then they'll go to that piece of content. And now, when enough users do that, they tell our machine learning algorithms that, you know what? The original intent is to get to that product. Even though the keyword is not the right one, this is what they're actually looking for. And now we'll start recommending that content to other users that are following in the footsteps of those persistent users that came in and did find the answer for them. So that's a great example of actually creating something. And this one could be, could be solved by you know, adding metadata on the result or something like that right? on the, uh, on the content that's actually in the index. That's one thing you can solve. I'll show you an even more interesting one. Um, if I go in here and if I search for something that's a bit more uh, tricky, I'm searching for CU CUAI 59. I get no results at all, nothing. Uh, but if I look at the machine learning now, machine learning results out of that, I get one result in the product, and that's the V220 cordless optical mouse. So uh, that was an interesting uh, discovery. And when you look at this, 
uh, and you figure out what the machine learning figured out, because in hindsight, you can actually <laughs> look at it and say, what, what actually happened there? It's actually that this piece number, the CUI59, is the part number for the wireless receiver for the mouse. So a lot of people come into the website, they don't know the model of the mouse that they have, but they do know what uh, the little dongle has, because that's right on the side of the computer. They see that, they search for that, and enough of them actually, after starting with that particular query, not getting any results, actually end up rewriting the query and going through the content and figuring out that this was the V220. And now they've instructed our system, which then passes on that knowledge to the users that come in after and tells them, here's probably what you're looking for if you're searching for CUI 59 on the Logitech website. We'll give you some, uh, some results that actually match that product. So that's, again, a great example of uh, the machine learning at work. And obviously, these are three specific examples. I'm sure there are hundreds. And that's the neat part about this, right? It's not limited to three or four rules that you create manually. This does it, uh, this does it automatically, continually, and just keeps improving the experience over time on, uh, on the site. Now, um, all right. I've already shown the store. One last example, uh, this one being uh, Adobe, uh, which is uh, around personalization, which is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. This is the, uh, the global uh, site uh, for uh, support Adobe. So if I search again for very generic query, search for crop on the uh, homepage there, what I'm getting actually is a number of results. And I'll actually highlight, again, using this little widget, what's coming back from the machine learning. So I'm getting some results for cropping PDF pages in Acrobat. I'm getting some results in Illustrator. I'm getting results in Photoshop Elements. This is probably based on the popularity, of course, of these products and uh, how ubiquitous they are within the, uh, within the ecosystem, uh, and also how often people actually look for crop and uh, for cropping capabilities within each of these products. So that's an interesting uh, thing happening on the website, and uh, a lot of users will get into that global portal. But what's going to happen as well, as we talked about, users are actually within Photoshop. They're actually using the Photoshop product, and they're doing this a little bit of a different way, right? They could just be coming in, and the traditional way would be Photoshop online help. So get me to the online help. So now I'm on the online help and support. That's interesting. Probably go in and do the same search. Search for crop. Oh, what happens? I'm getting a different set of results. Now I'm getting recommendations our automated relevant tuning, but just around Photoshop. Obviously, because I've given more context to the, uh, to the system. I'm coming from Photoshop, so I'm looking. It's highly likely that what I'm looking for is related to, uh, to the Photoshop product in this particular case. So I've got a uh, cropping and straining photos in Photoshop and, and all of that. And again, that's the traditional way. That's kind of the first step that you expect from a, uh, from, a, uh, from a company like Adobe to give you that kind of online experience so you can search from within uh, Photoshop. But they took it one step further. And again, exercising our APIs and again, leveraging the, uh, the capabilities in there, they've actually integrated search right within Photoshop as well and search for elements that are, again, provided from Cuveo and some from others, right? I'm searching for crop. I'm getting results back from the application itself. So crop tool, crop and straighten photos, uh, and that sort of stuff. But if I look here, I'm getting one of those results that you'll recognize, crop and straighten photos in Photoshop. That's really, really limited real estate, folks. We're getting one result spot. So you want to have machine learning push the best result in that particular slot, because if not, you're probably not, you're not using that limited real estate to its fullest capabilities. Uh, and you want to be able to do that, obviously. And then you've also got kind of a more, uh, a bit more real estate if you look at the Learn tab, which is all powered by Kaleo. So this is the same set of results you would get right on the website, but you're getting now from the, uh, from the uh, Kaleo powered, AI powered search directly within the, uh, within the Photoshop app. So again, Great, great use of our, uh, of our technology integrated within a uh, super, uh, um, super popular product. So uh, we can ask for more from as far as a showcase. Uh, so that's why I decided not to build a demo and rather use this. Uh, 
Um, all right, so uh, if you want to switch over to the other laptop, uh, I need to switch clickers, I think. Exactly. So that was the demonstration. Hopefully, some of this actually turned up some lights, and you guys are saying, we could do that as well. We'd love to do that. So uh, come, to talk, Tom, come and talk to us. We'll be happy to help you get these kinds of things going. Um, obviously, uh, this has driven a lot of momentum on our side. Everything starts with data. Uh, we're proud to uh, basically be able to say, we'll hit the 1 billion events sometime in July, which is a significant milestone for us. So we're, uh, we're getting more than 3.2 million events a day. Uh, we're getting more than 115 orgs sending us data every week and people coming into these orgs to view reports. More than 3,200 reports are being uh, produced every week by uh, our platform for you guys coming in, looking at what uh, kind of case deflection metrics you're getting, what kind of traffic you're getting on the site. So this is just great. And the more of that data we get, the more intelligent we can make the machine learning on top of that. So that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, talking machine learning, that's kind of the curve in terms of growth. Uh, we're getting more than 2.5 API calls a day, uh, 2.5 million API calls a day on our machine learning backend. 450 models are queried every day, uh, and 108 models are being updated every day. So that's part of our mission as well. A lot of companies talk about the science behind machine learning, and we know that the science is hard, and we keep making it. Uh, we keep actually using, uh, using those algorithms and making them better. But one thing that's super important in there is making it in such a way that you guys can use it. And that's part of uh, adding the complexity behind this. And this is kind of proof to that. Getting 450 models actually queried every day means that you're creating a lot of those models. Probably a lot of them you don't even know are acting behind the scenes, but they're making stuff better on the site and you can report on it. And that's just great. And finally, a uh, quick outlook on what we uh, will be investing in in the next 12 months, the main themes. We'll continue, obviously, on the personalization quest. So integrating with more third-party event stores, like what we demonstrated around the XDB. We'll also like, look at uh, leveraging uh, broader user history, some uh, e-commerce type workloads. Uh, a big theme in machine learning and AI space, the transparency, so being able to figure out why the algorithms are recommending A, B, or C, being able to actually put it in words for an end user. You're seeing that because other users have seen that, or because you've taken that action. This is why we're actually recommending that type of content. So giving users, again, more uh, confidence in what's being actually uh, is being recommended. And then finally, on the reporting uh, aspect, uh, as more and more data comes into the system, what we keep hearing is we need more intelligent reports. Obviously, we do a lot of reports today, and you guys are, again, as I said, loading a lot of those, uh, these reports every week, but getting more intelligent reports out there and being able to have a report in your inbox every, every morning, every week, telling you how the site's doing, what's happening, what you need to take a look at. Those are the kinds of uh, priorities that we will be investing in the next 12 months. And with that, Turn it over to, uh, oh, actually, I forgot the sessions. I've got more sessions. All right, so I've got two additional sessions coming uh, today, demystifying Kaveo machine learning uh, at, uh, at 3.15, and then tomorrow, uh, which will be more of an introduction uh, session, really, and then uh, tomorrow a bit more uh, of a deep dive with getting the most from uh, Kaveo machine learning uh, with myself and uh, Geneviève uh, from the uh, CSM team will actually uh, join me as well. And now that's true, now it is true, Turning it over to my friend Gautier for Kavil Platform update. All right, so um, let's talk about the core asset, the one that powers machine learning, all the Salesforce, Psycho, create use case. And if we look at the, the timeline, we really have three uh, major milestones in our platform. Um, the first one is actually, you know, the Covid Enterprise Search, the one that we started, you know, quite a few years ago, that was an on-prem product, um, you know, geared towards the enterprise, so meaning mostly Microsoft-centric at the time. And back in 2014, the guidance of, of Laurent, we actually started moving to the cloud, and that was kind of a, a lift and shift of what we had on premises. So we took, you know, a trusted asset, lifted up to the cloud, and that version was. Uh, designed specifically for Salesforce, or at least with Salesforce in mind, Coveo for Salesforce, 
Um, we added machine learning, usage analytics. Uh, we have hundreds of customers now on it. That thing's really scaled well. But in 2016, we decided, you know, it's time for a real cloud product built from the ground up. And that's what we call uh, Cloud V2. Um, this new platform, this new assets, let us support like uh, tons of new use cases. Uh, it's been designed both for you know, users, but also developers, so which much more uh, freedoms to uh, create uh, your own use cases, your own uh, assets, et cetera, and also target um, security and compliance. And we'll talk about that uh, in a few moments. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, this is what a Cloud V2 platform in the cloud looks like, kind of like V1. And that's on purpose. We don't want to confuse people, just new color scheme. Uh, but a ton of uh, feature. Uh, it's a brand new architecture, as I said. So it's not uh, an on-prem product that we push to the cloud. It's built with the cloud in mind. So that means that we have decoupled everything. We have built resilience uh, and scalability in every single uh, component in there. We use active, active component, multiple data centers, et cetera. Um, we use microservices. So meaning, because we have decoupled everything, that means that we can uh, upgrade and one of the assets um, on, on the side and improve performances, bring new features, et cetera, live without you guys noticing. And that's kind of what we use with the machine learning piece, the UAPs. All of that is decoupled, so we can evolve and uh, bring new feature constantly. Um, we have now what we call a push API infrastructure. So as Laurent said, one of our great assets has been the connectivity. Well, we wanted to make it easier for you guys to also develop your own connectors because you know, there's so much we can do. We can target the main enterprise content sources, but you all have homegrown uh, assets that you want to leverage. We made it uh, a lot easier for you to create that and take control. Um, indexing pipeline extension, I'll spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, if you remember, some of you might have heard about uh, conversion scripts. Um, those are conversion scripts on steroids, so much more powerful, letting you target external services uh, and bringing Coveo really to the next level. Um, crawling modules, well, we were talking about connectivity, we have been talking about the cloud, well, the reality of a lot of you and enterprise customer, some content sources are still on-premises for good and bad reasons. Uh, we recognize that, so we have created a technology that let us push content from behind the firewall to the cloud. And it's a one-way stream, so it's highly secure. Usually InfoSec loves that because they don't need to open the firewall. Uh, and that's very unique to Coveo to have that. Um, and yeah, we actually have a HIPAA environment. So if some of you are in healthcare or need an extra layer of security and compliance, uh, we have developed that. And that just shows our commitment to go and meet those compliance requirements that you might have to, to your own internal processes or regulation that you uh, are under. And hundreds of new APIs. So in the past, you know, Coveo was more black box. There was no clear APIs. Now, actually, those APIs are public, documented. And uh, please feel free to use them and hammer them as much as you want. So security. Uh, security is really our number one priority. And uh, if you've seen the sign outside, uh, security is not a six-minute uh, subject. It's a commitment. So we, we spend a lot of time and money uh, on that. And I'm not going to go to everything, but you know, it goes from isolating your data. We might be in the cloud, but everything that's private data, it's actually in isolation in your own machine, own drives, et cetera. There's no leakage possible. Uh, as I said, we go from disaster recovery resilience. And to guarantee that, it's not just us saying it. You know, we have third-party companies coming to audit us at least once a year, if not twice. Um, that's how we get to HIPAA. We do penetration testing. You know, it's very important today. We need to make sure that our code is secure, that you know, encryption keys are not leaked out there. All of that is done all the time. Um, and you know, we're bringing also new ways for you to authenticate to that platform to make it as secure as possible. So we're actually letting go of some of the good old password on Post-its as well. So one of the big thing of Cloud V2 is its modularity, as I said. And, and, and if we look, the first one is the push API. You know? And really see it as you taking control. You can build something with that push API. You can send your content, any type of content, to Coveo. Uh, but contrary to some other push API types of system out there, we actually recognize that we need to manage security and permission of that content. So we have bring that. 
Um, there is also options to uh, do batching, uh, support of very large files, because you know what you want to push to our cloud and what you want to search on, they're not just you know, little bits of data. They might be very large documents, images, et cetera. You can do that with the Push API. Um, the crawling modules, we right, talked about them. Um, they're right there. You can use them. Um, and we keep improving them and making it as easy as possible for you to, to use that technology and go and get that data that's behind your firewall and that you might find useful in the Coveo cloud. Indexing pipeline extensions. So those are those conversion scripts. Um, if you guys are developers and you know Python, that's uh, the, the, the language that we use behind them. Um, and you can use it for a wide array of use cases. It goes from modifying and enriching the content when it makes it to the index, you know, from modifying the title to um, scraping you know, for some private data that shouldn't be in there, social security number, credit card numbers, whatever. You can do that with the script, but you can also contact third party services. You know, there are best of breed third party services for your industry out there that might bring you taxonomy, that might bring text analytics that you might need, uh, deep learning, etc. You are free to contact them and consume those services uh, with Coveo. Um, and then also, we keep using that to expand the platform. So, optical image recognition, so OCR, uh, is going to, to come there. Uh, a little bit more deep learning, some more machine learning system will come through those extension scripts uh, that we can build. And the API, uh, as I said, it's public, it's documented. So again, if you're a developer, if you have a development team, you can go uh, to platform.cloud.coveo.com slash docs. It's actually showing you all the APIs, letting you try them uh, and move forward with your use cases and build great stuff like our friends at Adobe with the end product. Um, search. So we can switch laptop because that's great, but how can we see that uh, in action? And uh, I'm going to show you uh, something interesting. Actually, I'm going to join that. So who has heard about chatbot and conversational interfaces? I'm sure everybody has heard about it, and everybody's curious what can we do? What can we do with Coveo? Well, actually, with the platform, the decoupling of everything, the scripts, how we can um, you know, contact third party services, well, you can start building your own chatbot if you want it with Coveo. And you know, we can say, hey, contacting the Coveo chatbot on Slack. So it's not a new tool. It's something that most companies are using. And you can start your conversation with your chatbot. The first thing I can tell him, you know, it's nice outside and fine. And, an image with beach. And now the chatbot's actually returning me images. But as I said, we are actually contacting a third party service to do deep learning. Coveo itself doesn't do deep learning on images. And it's a question that we got of a lot of customers. Hey, what can you do with my images? Well, as you can see now, we can go look into your image and extract what's the content of that image. So now suddenly I can have a conversation about looking into my images, et cetera, uh, about the prototypes I can show you, about like, going through your slides and finding images in your PowerPoint presentation, et cetera. All of that can be done uh, with Coveo. So uh, other things that you can do, well, of course, we are search. So hey, search for, and I said you know, security is super important, cloud security. And now I'm finding results as well. So, you know, I'm in your context. So if you're using any kind of conversational interface in your company, you can do your search right there. But what's really interesting as well, and wrong clicker, you see that I have a yes or no button. Was this helpful? So now we can leverage Richard's machine learning as well. So I'm getting a conversation. I'm being returned. You know, very few results. You know, there's like 17,000 results available. Coveo is matching the two first one, and now I can say, hey, yes, this was useful, and that feeds the loop of the machine learning as a feature in the model. Okay, but we can go even further because you know, so far I've been returning, you know, uh, document like the entire page. Hey, I'm searching for something that's something in the document, but. You know, when you're doing a conversation with a friend, 
What you really want is to get the answer, not, hey, the answer will be in that document, et cetera. So I can do that as well. What are the version for the Confluence connector, for example? So what version are we supporting? And now what you can see is that I'm being returned exactly the answer to my question, but it comes from, no, it's small, but it comes from the website. So I'm not returning the page from our Coveo website. I'm just returning the data that's important on that page. And you can build all of that with the, the Coveo platform, the indexing pipeline extension, uh, and it doesn't take that long, just a little bit of curiosity to do it. Um, you can push it even further. Think about if you're a developer uh, in the room and you know, if you're using you know, Visual Studio or any kind of uh, um, development environment, sometimes you have questions about, hey, what does that function do? How do we use it, et cetera? And then you go to Stack Overflow, et cetera, to find the information. Well, Coveo you know, could be embedded in that. So I could be searching for show doc uh, for something that we call Crate Builder. So that's for UI interface. And that's, that's a very long document if you, if you go actually to uh, our documentation or GitHub. Now, if I'm in the, my editor, like Visual Studio, et cetera, you know, while I'm typing Crate Builder, I could be getting exactly what it does, uh, what you know, variable should I use, et cetera, immediately with Coveo. And so you can build that in any tool that you, you have. Um, you can go even further with your uh, conversation. You know, we can leveraging you know, um, term detection, as Richard talked about. We can go and have you know, time frames being expressed by people. So um, you know, it's, uh, it's a good company uh, in the news right now. So we can do a search for you know, what happened with Whole Foods. And, uh, tech news since last week, for those that have not heard. So, so you know I have something since, since last week, since the past two days, et cetera. So you can start expressing uh, time frame without going to facet and complex uh, Boolean operator. And I'm going to search, you know, data that have been indexed from the web, and I'm getting information about Amazon buying Whole Foods. And, you know, that's not Whole Foods one year ago, it was Whole Foods last week, et cetera. So, all, uh, all these are things that you can build. Um, if you're interested in knowing how that works exactly under the hood, we have a session tomorrow that will uh, detail all of that. So you can switch back to Thank you. So just a quick reminder, because really at the core of everything I've been showing is those indexing pipeline extensions. And you know, very small scripts, some of the scripts that uh, have been running here, they're less than 15 lines of code. So it's really, really powerful. Uh, but what's really important as well is that we can leverage those external services. So, you know, it goes from, you know, translation API. You know, sometimes you guys have been asking, yeah, I have document or I've come, you know, um, subsidiaries abroad, how do I translate that, et cetera. You could do that on the fly. Uh, with the, the scripts, you can leverage systems like Amazon Recognition or Microsoft Cognitive Services uh, for deep learning uh, on images, uh, other services for text analytics, even Salesforce um, Einstein could be uh, leveraged as well. So we're not competing. We could be supplementing Coveo uh, with other services as well. So that's exciting. But what's coming in the next 12 months? Um, number one, again, security, you know, I, I want to really emphasize that it takes time, it takes effort, but it's super important for you. And you'll get more ways to authenticate. So, you know, today with our Cloud Platform V2, you have to use some SAML provider, so some uh, unified provider, you'll be able to use your own. Um, more ways to monitor everything that's happening in that platform, more ways to control uh, if everything is going fine. So as part of the security, we want to give you that um, feeling that you are in charge and you know exactly what's happening even though it's a SaaS provider. Extensibility, well, you know, ex everything uh, that I've showed is pretty cool. So we want to keep working on that. Uh, so more API is coming. If you, so we're going to keep opening that platform. 
the push API is actually going from a V1 to a V2, making it easier to use. So, uh, you know, making handling of large files, images, et cetera, um, just a no-brainer. Uh, indexing pipeline extension, new, new options are coming. So we're going to offer um, pre-built extension. If you don't know to code and don't want to code, et cetera, mo the most wanted one are going to be offered out of the box, and you just need to fill up the gap. Uh, very easy to use. Uh, we're going to have its more technical uh, asynchronous extension. So if you have third-party services that you want to contact, but they take longer to answer because you know, it's a longer process, they need to do some scrubbing of data, et cetera, it will be possible as well. We will create uh, different queues for that. And then we'll keep expanding uh, that platform. So more external services, and, and you know, we will be documenting those hooked into those external services. We won't let you on your own trying to figure it out. Uh, be curious, but we will also make that available. There will be the return of OCR that we used to be in our on-prem product. It's coming back to the cloud using actually extension as well. And more fun stuff coming, but Laurent will talk about that because I give him the right to do that. He's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> And two sessions before we leave. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Gautier. Um, so we have spent time on Sitecore. We spent time on Salesforce. We spent time on machine learning. Just spent time on how we orchestrate all of the behind the scene um, interaction between the components. Now let's, let's spend the last, uh, the, the next five minutes um, on the index. It used to be our core asset. Now it's, um, it's, it's moving into a different category, but it's exciting. So let's talk about what we call, a very generic term, the index agnostic platform. Um, I want to start by kind of describing at a high level what we do today, right? So we've got user analytics at the top, machine learning, our JavaScript UI, our query engine. We've got the connectivity in the middle, and we have our native Coveo index at the bottom. And really, the advantage of this infrastructure that is not going away, by the way, the entire stack is managed by Coveo. It's got end-to-end -end compliance and security. Everything that goes into this is our responsibility, basically, right? It's got advanced features. Hey, there's a HIPAA option, too. And it's got proven reliability and maturity. Here's where we're going. We are going to provide this option in the future. So we are decoupling the platform, we're removing the index so the platform here can be an index agnostic platform as an option. With the same components at the top, with our connectors here, we will have some enterprise connectors coming. This will run on our cloud, but we'll have the possibility to connect to someone else's index. So we have selected to, we've selected Elasticsearch as a technology to connect to. Those Elasticsearch clusters can be hosted on Amazon, can be hosted on Azure, can be hosted on Salesforce, Heroku. Um, we don't care. What we want is for this at the top to run on our, to run on our own cloud and connect to those indices that are everywhere. And what are the advantages of that? What are the advantages of that? Um, it will allow Coveo to include a very large developers community out there that is already investing in Elasticsearch as a core indexing technology. It will also leverage existing in Elasticsearch install base. So I bet some of you have some Elasticsearch that are running in your businesses somewhere. 
And this is a fairly elegant way to add this content and add those indices inside the Coveo umbrella and apply some machine learning on top of it and capture user event in the user analytics and so on. It's also a pretty elegant fix to some data governance challenges that may happen in Europe, that may happen in um, highly regulated industries where on-premise is the only option for the future. Well, the content that is at rest that we keep is in the index. If we run that on an Azure in Europe or on your own on-premise, then we remove a lot of the complexity that is around data uh, governance. It opens to Azure and other clouds. So some of you may have uh, Azure credits that are unused in your businesses. So maybe, maybe it's easy for you to start indexing more, but on those Azure, on, the, on this Azure infrastructure that you already uh, pay for. So for us, it's a big deal. It's, um, it's another option that customers and partners will have. We are piloting this at the end of this year, in 2017 Q4. Gautier is running that program here at Caveo. So please make sure if you're interested or have more questions about it, please make sure to, uh, to contact Gautier before the end of conference. And uh, finally, please make sure to meet our product team during this conference. So you've seen Rich, Sawan, and Gautier. We also have Greg Laporte at the top right, who's our product manager for Caveo for Salesforce and Simon Langevin at the bottom right, who's our product manager for Sitecore. So please meet with them if you have questions. We are here for you during this week, and there are other sessions as you, as you saw later on. All right, so with that, I thank you all for your presence. Thank you all for your interest in Coveo and commitment in Coveo and hope to talk to you in, uh, in, the, coming, uh, in the coming days. Thank you.